we have been talking about the move to the classical period of Greek art as being primarily a stylistic change toward uh, a sense of perennial, perpetual rest, but the capability for action versus a particular action. We have been talking about the shift from archaic Greek art to classical Greek art, and we have been defining it so far as a change in style from a kind of art that owes its origins to ancient Egypt that shows the figure in motion, albeit somewhat flat-footed, to a figure that's much more uh, naturalistic, realistic, and also relaxed, but coiled and expressive and ready for any kind of motion, understood through uh, the interrelationship of the different body parts between the flexed leg and the relaxed leg, the opposite flexed arm and relaxed arm, how the body opens one direction, the face opens the opposite direction, uh, one leg forward, the other shoulder back, all of this contraposto as the hallmark of the classical style. But the change in the classical style also coincides with the major historical event, in particular the end of the Persian War, the uh, victory of Athens over the troops of Persia in 480 BC, and this ushered in the single greatest period of Greek history. Uh, this brings about, in the middle of the 6th century, the period of Socrates and philosophy as Aeschylus in literature, uh, history writers, Herodotus, all the great names of Greek history all date from this period after the conclusion of the Persian War, this classical Greek period. Now, even though Athens was victorious in that war over Persia, much of Athens was left in ruins, um, including an old temple uh, to the city goddess Athena, after whom Athens is named, that was built on this huge, flat-topped, rocky outcrop in the middle of the city. It had been there since the founding of Athens, um, and had been totally destroyed during the Persian War. So this is the Acropolis, it quite literally means city on high. We talk about it online, uh, but the building the Parthenon was meant to be a monument to the victory over the Persians. We talked about the building online, but here we're going to talk about the sculptures that adorn it as we make up for our lost class. You enter the Acropolis up a long ramp that leads to a gateway here that actually sets you up with the view that we're seeing here as you come on to the top of the Acropolis. So you have your postcard corner on view as you enter uh, through the monumental gateway. At the same time, the entry to the temple is on the opposite side, so you had to walk around the outside of it in order to actually enter the temple and see the colossal figure of Athena inside. Like other Greek temples, it originally had sculptures. Uh, there's the entryway, right, and there you can see how you would enter through and come around to the other side. It originally had sculptures, but only above the column. Uh, we had uh, figures in the trees section, what we call the metopes, in, in a Doric building, these square areas between the triglyphs uh, on the outside. We're going to look at those. Um, each side of the building had a series of metope themes that showed a different mythological battle. And each of these battles was intended as an allegory for the Athenians' victory over the Persians. So we don't actually see that war. What we do see are allegories that symbolize that war. And the way that the Greek artists depict this is that each of the battle is, battles is depicted as a triumph of civilization over barbarism, a uh, triumph of order over chaos, which is exactly the uh, propaganda they want. This is how they want to remember that war, that civilization won out. 
So what we're seeing here uh, in the meta piece uh, is the story of, uh, again, mythological story, where one tribe, the Lapis, had a daughter who was marrying uh, the son of the centaur tribe. Centaurs, as you know, are half humans, half animal. And in Greek art, figures that are half animal are subhuman. And the centaurs were friends with Dionysus and thus uh, drunkards. And uh, to the Greeks, who focus on humanity, of course, animals are bad things. And so what happens at this wedding is that the centaurs get drunk and try to carry off all of the female guests. And, of course, the centaurs are forced, forced uh, to fight for the honor of their women, and they eventually defeat these centaurs. As such, this is a symbol of the defeat of chaos, of nature even, by the forces of order, by the forces of reason. Now, we've seen that the classical, in the classical period, sculpture focuses more on the potential for action than it does on action itself. Here, the story demands that there's some action, but you'll notice that the figures still have a sense of coiled energy waiting to spring forth, even though we do have quite a bit of action. Uh, that's because it would be impossible to tell the story otherwise. But if you look at this figure here, you can see that he seems in many ways around the torso to derive from contrapostal examples, as does this figure laying over here. When we look at the woman being carried off by one of the centaurs, we see uh, that the uh, uh, drapery looks as if it's wet. It clings to her body. Note here the robe draped over the shoulder of this fallen lapid man. Here also has that wet uh, style to it. This wet drapery style is a characteristic of the style of the sculptor Phidias. He was the supervisor of all of the sculpture on the Parthenon, and he kept the style consistent, even though multiple sculptors were working on this at the same time. He's responsible for this wet drapery style that we'll see on all of the Parthenons. So these metopes decorate the frieze on the outside of the Doric building. Uh, and each of the four faces had a different uh, meta-allegorical, mythological battle meant to be an allegory for the victory of the Persians. So they are out here. Yeah. On the outside of the building, there's a second place for sculpture, just as there was in other buildings that we'd seen before, and that is on the pediments up above in these triangular areas at the very top of the building. So you come in through this side, but you enter the temple through the side that you see on our left. This is the primary entrance. And this is the one that has the most famous and best preserved sculptures of the entire building. Since through this door you would see a colossal statue of Athena, the goddess of the city, the pediment on the top actually depicts, uh, and here we can see some of the, uh, the sculptures that appear here, the pediment on the top actually depicts the birth of Athena. Now, here we're looking at a copy of the Parthenon made to measure, full-size copy, um, down in Nashville, Tennessee, which you can go see. You'll notice also that this copy of the Parthenon also shows uh, the fact that it was originally painted. This is true for all Greek buildings, that they were, in fact, originally polychromed. And we're used to seeing them monochrome because the paint has all worn off. But that's not the way the building originally appeared. Now, the story here is that, and there's another view of it, Zeus um, had been told by a, an oracle, has been uh, prophesied, that uh, his lover would give birth to his successor in heaven. And as the legend goes, Zeus then ate his lover. And at that point, his son, Zeus's son, Hephaestus, cut his head open with an axe, and Athena stepped out, armed fully. So here, in the middle of this, we see Zeus and Athena. We don't see the bloody uh, birthing scene, but there she is, fully armed, having emerged 
from uh, the head of her father, Zeus. Somehow Zeus survives all this. I guess if you're king of the gods in heaven, you can get away with that sort of thing. So that's the central focus as you entered, was uh, the birth of Athena fully armed, and that's exactly you can see her with her arms in a 60-foot colossal statue on the inside. Um, around that center, uh, the rest of the gods and goddesses are attending the event and watching. So here on the far left in the pediment, we see uh, the god of wine, Dionysus. And directly next to him is the god of the sun, Helios, uh, driving the chariot of the sun up over the horizon. And it sets on the opposite side. Um, so when we look at Dionysus here, we'll notice that he's not really doing anything. He's laying back. He's relaxing. He's laying on, on, on wet drapery, that typical wet drapery style of Phidias, probably originally holding a cup of wine, but shown, again, utterly flexed like he's doing crunches, um, and uh, in, in a pose that is typical for the classical period, a pose that shows this potential to do anything, a reserve of energy without expending any energy. There's no particular moment here. There's no specific point in this, if we can compare it back to archaic Greece art, we saw, in fact, a very particular moment in this uh, warrior's life as he's struggling to stay alive. There's certainly no struggle here for Dionysus. He has that timelessness uh, all the time in the world to do anything that he might. This is a hallmark of what distinguishes classical Greek art from archaic Greek art. Now, in the opposite corner, uh, we had three goddesses. Uh, they cannot be identified with any certainty, uh, which of the three goddesses they are, but you'll notice that again, they are relaxed and reposed. They're waiting to do something. This could be looks like she's almost ready to stand up, but not quite. And then the other two significantly more, uh, laid back. Again, notice the clothing. Um, men, had been nude, uh, really all the way up to the 4th century, where women are clothed. Um, and this is, again, part of the patriarchal uh, nature of Greek society. But also notice that wet drapery style that's used consistently to harmonize all of the decorations. Uh, many, many different sculptors were working on the Parthenon, all of them under the direction of a single sculptor, uh, Phidias, and we'd seen that, in fact, this wet drapery can be found everywhere, even though Phidias is simply uh, directing uh, the different sculptors working for him. Right? And, in fact, we also see it here, as I mentioned, uh, on the rock that Dionysus relaxes. Well, in the Middle Ages, um, the Christians converted the Parthenon into a church, and these pagan sculptors were removed from the church because uh, they didn't fit its new reuse um, under medieval Christianity. And they were left laying around the base uh, of the Parthenon. Um, around the year 1800, up to around 1802, a British archaeologist who had colonized Greece took the best of these sculptures back with them. Here they are in London. Uh, the man who took them back, Lord Elgin, uh, housed them in the British Museum, um, and they've been there ever since. Greece desperately wants these things back. It's the high point of their entire history, and they've recently renewed their claim by building a museum at the foot of the, of the Acropolis where you can look up at the building and see the sculptures that would have adorned that building. What they have here are some of the originals, uh, some of the metapiece ones, not many of them, and uh, casts of the works that are in the, uh, the British Museum. So here's the knee of our three goddesses there, as we can now look up and imagine where they originally were. 
But Britain refuses to give them back uh, for fear that their museum will be gutted of everything that wasn't British. And uh, this remains sort of an ethical debate over uh, who really owns these things uh, that were taken uh, over 200 years ago. But we're not quite done with the sculptures on the Parthenon yet. Uh, the gods were on the pediments on the outside, and we saw mythological battles in the exterior frieze, uh, in the metopes that appear in the frieze on the outside. Remember that there's a set of sculptures behind the columns as well, on the inside, and there it's a continuous frieze that runs around all four sides of the actual house of the, uh, of the statue, the actual temple housing the statue. Remember that the colonnade surrounds that. And whereas we have gods and mythology uh, on the outside with the columns, here on the inside we have the people of Athens. Uh, the Athenians themselves are illustrated here, not as portraits, but as representatives of them. And what they are shown doing on that phrase behind the columns that wraps all the way around the building is they are making a procession to bring offerings to Athena. And this is something that actually happened every four years. They would make a ritual gown to clothe that colossal sculpture of Athena inside. And so what we're seeing is something that occurred in ancient Athens once every four years. If we look at this in detail, you'll notice again the contrapposto pose that we saw elsewhere in the 5th century, that hallmark of the classical period. You'll also notice that the men are more or less clothed than the women. Again, that's typical. But you can also see that the wet drapery style uh, that we saw with the goddesses and other figures also continues here, that drapery style associated with Sidious. This uh, procession that we're looking at, this one continuous freeze, begins on the side we first see as we come up on the Parthenon. So in other words, it more or less follows our trajectory. So it starts here over uh, the top inside here, and it then moves down the side and concludes directly over the door just as we do. So I've sort of animated this, right? It comes up, it's down the long side, concluding over the door to the uh, statue of Athena. It, it follows the same route that anybody making the procession would have followed. So the scene that we're seeing here is toward the end, where uh, the Athenians are concluding their procession and are about to hand off the cloth, the robe, to the keepers of the temple to close this massive statue of Athena. Uh, your text illustrates one other image from the Parthenon trees toward the beginning, uh, where we see the Athenians getting ready to start the procession. Uh, their horses are kicking at them as they are uh, uh, trying to hold them back, uh, anxiously hoping that those uh, that they'll get their turn to move forward. Whereas at the very end, of course, everyone stands in in contraposto. But you'll notice here that even though the horses are rearing up, in fact, some of them are jumping clean off the ground, this one here, right, isn't even touching the ground. You'll notice that our, our figures are calm in the saddle. Uh, again, almost as if they're sitting in contraposto, where they are in repose despite the fact that the animals are, are so furious. Um, it doesn't seem to affect them all. They have that same looseness uh, that we saw with the, with the spear bearer. Well, that's the end of the Parthenon and the end of this screencast to try to make up for uh, lost time in class. Uh, we'll see you uh, next time.